this time, I encourage you, if you have your Bible with you, start turning with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke, uh, we will be in chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And as you're turning there, you will hopefully come to realize that this is a very well-known passage within the Gospels. It's actually one that I believe is in the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's the telling of a story or, or perhaps even a parable. We don't necessarily know that this was an actual living person because Christ shares this with those around him as a means of teaching a lesson. And oftentimes we see Christ does that in many ways. He will tell a parable, uh, like the parable of the Good Samaritan. We don't necessarily know that the Good Samaritan was a real person, but we do know that the implications of the lesson are very much so real and very much so important. And this is one of the parables that we see Jesus teaches on, and it's a reminder to us of the folly of self-righteousness. In the world that we live in today, just as, as much as was true in the world that Christ lived, and years and years before that, even back to Adam and Eve themselves, self-righteousness has been something that humans have always struggled with. And what I mean by self-righteousness is to seek to declare oneself right or righteous or clean and oftentimes in doing so, we might fall into the false belief that we are righteous while others are not. That we perhaps might have a better standing than others. And I believe it's here that we must understand that Jesus teaches against such belief. These ideological beliefs that we are righteous in and of ourselves or that we are righteous because of the things that we do. In fact, Lord willing, we will hopefully see that we are only righteous by one thing, or more specifically one person, and that is Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let's look at verses 9 through 14 of Luke 18. It says, and he, speaking about Jesus, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican or a tax collector. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Here we have that very well-known parable in which we see two individuals, the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee who was on the outside, many people would look at him and say, well, he's a religious man because I can tell by his title or by the way that he dressed. Pharisees were very much so typically well-known in communities in which they lived not only by their work, but by the way that they dressed. They all had certain, uh, I don't want to say outfits, but I don't necessarily know how else to put it. They had very much so similar dress codes. Pharisees dressed this certain way, and in, in media you might see them portrayed, they are often seen as they're wearing black robes and they have this large uh, robe-covered hat. They're black and white. 
and they would have been very well known in the community just by the sight of them. People would have been able to see them from afar off and known that's a religious leader or that's a Pharisee. And then we have a tax collector, a publican, who is very much so hated by the society around them. The tax collectors were individuals who, by choice of their own, worked for the Roman Empire to go out and collect taxes from their own people. And the way that they would make money is they would often overcharge by a, a very liberal number. They were, to my understanding, given free reign to tax for themselves. So we see individuals like Zacchaeus in the Gospels who he is encountering Christ and when he comes to Christ and repents of his sin, he makes mention of the fact that he's been overcharging people by quite a bit and that he's, he's going to make it a point to return that which he has overcharged. We don't necessarily know anything about this publican in the parable, but we do know he is as what society would view him as. He is seen as a sinful man. Why? Because he is someone who, in the eyes of the world at least, betrayed his own people. Now, the publican is standing afar off, and the Pharisee is praying at the temple. And we have these two examples. And Christ give these, gives these two examples for a very specific reason and to a very specific audience. Notice, if you will, in verse 9, it says, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Jesus is speaking this particular lesson to people in his presence who trusted in themselves and believed that they were righteous for a variety of reasons. And this is what we must first confront when it comes to the folly or the foolishness of self-righteousness. You see, the scriptures are very clear that man and woman, in their original state, they are sinful before the Lord. Mark 10, verses 17 and 18. Turn there, if you will, with me. Mark 10, verse 17. This is the story of the rich young ruler that you may very well be familiar with. A young man who is very wealthy comes and asks a very specific question. Verse 17 tells us, And when he was gone forth, this being Jesus, into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So we have this rich young ruler coming and he kneels down before Christ and he asks a very uh, relevant question, one that we must all ask at some point and hopefully have all asked. What must I do to enter into eternal life or inherit eternal life? It's interesting what Jesus does here. See, in verse 18, he doesn't just flat out give the answer. He, he goes on to speak towards this reality, but he makes a point at how the young man had addressed him. He says in verse 18, Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So the rich young ruler, he comes, and, and perhaps it's out of uh, just being cordial or, or being very nice to Christ. He says, good master or good teacher, good rabbi, what must I do to be saved? Or what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus makes a very subtle but very important point. He says, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, and that is God. And what we must understand here is Jesus, in a very subtle way, is pointing out the reality that this rich young ruler is absolutely correct in calling him good master. Because the only one who truly is good, in comparison, of course, to man and God, is God. The only one who is righteous is God. How do we know this? We have places elsewhere in the scriptures. Romans chapter 3. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 3. Paul here is writing to the church at Rome, and one can only begin to imagine the 
depravity that was taking place in the city of Rome at the time of Paul. He makes mention to it in, in his writings to the Romans, but there's a lot of, of sinfulness taking place, not just in Rome, but all over the world. But Paul, in Romans 3, he quotes from one of the Psalms. In chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, notice what Paul says. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And that's a very straight to the point answer. There's no getting around that when you read. There is no one who's righteous. No, not one. Typically, you won't be able to look at that and say, well, what Paul was really trying to say was there are several who are righteous, and I'm one of them. I know he's saying, in and of ourselves, apart from Christ, in our natural state, we are unrighteous. Going on, <clears throat> going on in verse 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And if we skip down to verse 23, a very well-known scripture within the church. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is where we are in our natural state. Apart from our relationship with the Lord, we are sinful and we do not seek that which is good by the Lord's standards. We know that there are those who might be outwardly moral by the world's standards, but when it comes to God's standard, we have all fallen short. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Thus, we must understand that our natural state is one of depravity, one in which none of us can declare ourselves righteous by our nature or by our works, as we will see in a moment. In fact, we have elsewhere places like in the Old Testament. This is not something that's new. Jesus is not teaching something that is contrary to that which what the Jews already believe. Turn with me, if you will, to Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, we see Jeremiah makes this very poignant but certainly important note of our natural state. The world will tell us things like, just follow your heart. Just do what feels right. And while those things might sound okay on the outskirts, we must understand that the scriptures are clear in verse 9 of Jeremiah 17. It says, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We might be tempted to give advice like that. Just follow your heart or do what you feel to be right. But what we must understand is our heart in and of itself is not righteous alone. We do not have any righteousness or right standing before God in and of ourselves. We are to the bone, deceitful, and lost in our sin. Isaiah puts it very beautifully, eloquently. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Notice how Isaiah speaks on humans and our righteousness. He says, but we are all. And I believe he's not just talking about the Jewish people. I believe he's speaking of humanity here. We all are as an unclean thing. And then he says, all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Isaiah basically is saying here, we might think that we're good and of ourselves. We might think that we're righteous. But any righteousness that we might think we have, it's nothing more than like a filthy rag that is useless, that is not something to be cherished or pointed towards. It is not anything that we can stand upon. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. 
And here we have Christ teaching this, this idea that this crowd that's around him, they believe they're righteous. They believe that they have a good standing with God by their very nature and perhaps by the works that they do. And Jesus points this out. We're not righteous in and of ourselves. And secondly, we cannot make ourselves righteous. There's no good work that we can do to make ourselves right with God. There's no good thing or good deed we can partake in to make ourselves clean in and of ourselves. This is the very message of the gospel, that Christ came and lived the perfect life that we could not, and he laid that life down as an atonement, as a sacrifice for our sins. And because our trusting in him, by the work of the Holy Spirit in us, that that is what justifies us. That is what makes us right before God. So we must understand it. It's, it's nothing to do with works. We can be as close to the Christ-like image in this world as we can. But if we don't have Christ, then that means we are unrighteous still. We can be as morally upright as we want to be, but if we do not have Christ in our hearts, then that is nothing but unrighteousness. Turn back with me to our original passage, Luke 18. Look at verses 11 through 12. Luke 18, 11 through 12. Jesus speaks towards the first individual in this parable, the Pharisee. And he says, verse 11, that the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So here we have the public, I mean, the, the Pharisee pointing towards the publican and saying, God, thank you that I am not a sinner like that person. And we see that the Pharisee believes that he is righteous by way of pointing out his works. Verse 12, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. See, the Pharisee is saying, I know that I'm righteous or I'm good because of all the things that I do. We must understand that as Christians, we might be tempted to think the same thing. Well, I know that I'm a Christian or I know that I'm right with God because I do all these things. But it's here that we must understand that works do not justify the man. The justification that God gives causes good works. That is a very important distinction that we must understand and know that I am not a Christian and I'm not right with God because I have done all these things. No, I do all these things because I have been made right with God by Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2, Paul makes this clear. Galatians 2 verse 16. I always have to go through every now and again. I don't know why. When I'm looking for these four particular books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians. Galatians always comes first because of Georgia Electric Power Company. That's how you have to remember. (laughs) So, G-E-P-C. But in Galatians 2.16, listen to what Paul says. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law... But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now he goes into this teaching and for the rest of this chapter and pretty much for the entirety of chapter 3, we see Paul gives us this understanding that our justification is by way of faith. And that faith is not something that we have taken upon ourselves. We have not obtained faith in Christ 
by our actions, but it's by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. God sends his Holy Spirit to regenerate our hearts and causes us to then be able to believe, to be able to be born again. We're not saved by our works, but we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, which is a gift from God, as we'll see. Turn now, continuing in, in the end of chapter 3 of Galatians, or the ending portion, Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Paul makes it clear that the law, which the Old Testament is comprised of in a great sense, the Torah, the, the law of God, that by those things no one can earn righteousness. Those things are not given to point us to this works-based system. God did not give the law to his people in the Old Testament to say, if you follow all these things, and if you get this right and get this right and get this right, you're going to climb the ladder out of sin, and you're going to be right in my sight. Now, he forgives sins in the Old Testament by way of the sacrificial system, but it's all pointing to one Person, It's all pointing to one thing, and that is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Look, if you will, to Galatians 3, verse 21. Paul says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For there, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So he's basically saying here, if we could be made righteous by keeping the law, then God would have given us that law. He would have said, this is the law that will make you righteous. But instead, we must understand going on, verse 22, the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Remember, as we looked at earlier in Romans 3.23, all fall short of the glory of God. Why? Because all have sinned. This is important because going on in verse 22, it says that the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should have afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law was given so as to point us to our need for an external Savior. The law was given, as Paul says, as a schoolmaster to teach us our sinfulness, to teach us that we cannot keep God's law in its totality. It's an impossibility. Even if we kept all of the law except for one, we're guilty of breaking God's commandment. We must understand this is of great importance because the law points us to Christ. The law points us to the external salvation that we have in Christ. That I cannot be self-righteous because I have no righteousness to promote. I cannot be proclaiming that I am good in and of myself or by my works. Like the Pharisee says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes on all that I own. We as Christians cannot point to anything and say, I am good because I go to church, or I am good because I give an offering. I am good because I serve in this way. No, we say, the only reason that I have righteousness is because Jesus Christ has placed it in me. He has imputed his righteousness to me. He has justified me before my heavenly Father. This is what we must understand. Self-righteousness is something that we cannot partake in. First of all, because we're not righteous. Second of all, because we could never be righteous on our own. We're only seen as just or justified in the eyes of God by way of faith in Jesus Christ. This brings us back then to our original text, Luke 18, verses 13 and 14. Let's look at the second person spoken of here. We've already looked at the Pharisee who believed himself to be uh, righteous in and of himself. I apologize. I, I skipped a, a scripture, but uh, 
We're going to look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and then look at Luke 18. The Pharisee believed himself to be righteous by his works, but the scriptures say here, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, probably a verse that all of us are well familiar with. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Notice verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. This goes back really to our scripture reading this morning, 1 Corinthians, where Paul makes it clear that the only way that we are righteous is by Christ. The only one who gives us righteousness and justification is Christ. We cannot boast of any goodness of ourselves because we have none to offer. Our goodness comes by way of the grace of God. And it's here that going back again to Luke 18, 13 through 14, we see that second individual in this parable mentioned. And it's here that we ought to understand this is how we ought to react when tempted to be self-righteous or to point to ourselves and think of ourselves as good and better than others. Verse 13 of Luke 18, it says, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, meaning he, he beats upon himself. And that is an action there. Notice the, the actions that he's, he's partaking in. He will not even come close. It says he's afar off. He won't look up. His eyes are looking down. And he's smoting his breast or beating himself on the chest. This is all the actions of someone who I would understand to be sorrowful for their sin. They're ashamed of their sin. They feel the guilt of their sin. They say, I am not worthy of God. I am not worthy of his grace. And we as Christians must all understand this is where we ought to live. We must all ought to have this mindset of, I'm not worthy of the grace God has given. God didn't save me because uh, this reason, A, B, and C. God didn't save me because I did all of these good things. No. God saves me by his grace and grace alone. Not because I'm good, but despite the fact that I'm not good. It says he is far off, he's not looking unto the heavens, and he's, he's smoting upon his breast. Look at what he says. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So the Pharisee in this parable is not the one who leaves and is just or in a state of righteousness. He is not a one, he is not one of the ones, if you will, in this parable at least, who goes away and things are well. No, the one who goes away and is justified, the one who goes away and is in a state of right nature with God, is the one who declares his humble state before the Lord. He's not trying to exalt himself over others. He's not trying to lift himself up and say, look at how good I am. But he's going to the Lord and saying, thank you, Lord, that despite the fact that I am a sinner, you saved me and you showed me mercy. It says, going on in verse 14, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Randy Alcorn, a very well-known Christian author, he says this. He says, humility isn't pretending that we're unworthy because it's spiritual. It's recognizing that we're unworthy because it's true. To be humble is not to pretend like you're unworthy just so others around you might get a better view of who you are that others around you might think of yourself as being better but humility is realizing that I, I actually am unworthy of God's grace 
This is a truth. This is not just me putting on airs or pretending. We are, apart from the grace of God, unworthy. But Christ gives us worth. He imputes to us the gift of justification, meaning that if we believe on Christ by his work in our life, if we believe on him unto salvation, that we are now just before the Father. That he looks upon us and where at one time he looked and saw nothing but sinfulness and depravity and unrighteousness. He looks at us through the lens of Jesus Christ. That Christ covers our sin. Christ is the one who is now standing in the way, if you will. He is shielding us from that wrath that we so rightly deserve. Not only is he shielding us, but he took it upon himself on the cross. He took our wrath for our sin, or God's wrath for our sin. Paul reminds us, and he reminds the early church of this great truth. I want you to listen to, we're going to look at two statements by Paul as we look to the reality of of how we should see ourselves in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians 15, which is, I would say, the resurrection chapter of the Bible. Uh, It is, let's see, 58 verses in which Paul talks greatly about the resurrection and its implications on the Christian. Verses 9 through 10, he speaks a little bit about himself. And if you know anything about Paul, you know that he was at one time very much so the definition of what it meant to be an enemy of God, just as all of us at one time were. But notice he says, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. He says, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which has which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul here is making this this very clear statement to the church at Corinth. He's saying, of all the apostles, and you think about who the apostles mainly were, we think about the disciples, those who spent time with Christ physically. Uh, Paul is referred to as an apostle in the early church because while he wasn't walking with Christ as a disciple during his first advent, we know that Christ revealed himself on the road to Damascus and that Christ teaches Paul all of these beautiful truths that he is, he's seen all throughout the Old Testament, God working the plan of redemption. So Paul in the church is often referred to, even at this time, as an apostle. Because he's called by God, he's spent time with Christ. Paul says, I'm not, I'm not worthy of this title. I have done terrible things. I've persecuted the church of God. Think of all the things Paul did as he was Saul. He is there at the stoning and martyrdom of Stephen. He gives, essentially, people are looking to him as to perhaps what should we do. Stephen is preaching this gospel of Jesus Christ and it tells us that Saul was there and people essentially laid their their coats down near Saul and he's giving freedom to the Jews to kill Stephen for his actions. He's essentially overseeing the death of Stephen. We know that Paul or Saul prisoned many people within the church. And his attitude is, I love this, and it's something I think we ought to view ourselves as. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Meaning, one time I was completely an enemy of God. I was a sinner beyond belief. But by God's grace, that's not who I am anymore. We as Christians, I think, can learn a lot from that statement. We might not have outwardly been as sinful as Paul. We might not have been seen as the enemy of the church. But in the eyes of God, all of us 
as was seen earlier, have fallen short of his glory. All of us are unworthy of his grace. All of us are rightly under his wrath. But, beautiful three-letter level, three letter word, but, by the grace of God, I am what I am. We as Christians, I believe, can learn greatly from this. To understand that we have no righteousness to stand on on our own. We can't point to ourselves and say, I am such a good person. I am such a wonderful human being. But we must always say, I am a sinner who by the grace of God is a saint. I am a sinner who was saved by the grace of God. And it's only by his grace that I am what I am. Thomas von Kempen. He was a German, or a Dutch, I believe, individual within the church. I can't remember if it's the 1600s or 1700s, I'm not sure, but I love this quote that he says. He says, I can only assume that God looked down from heaven to find the smallest and most insignificant creature, and seeing me, he took me up and used me. I love that, that view he has. He says, I can only imagine that God was looking and saying, okay, who is the lowliest of, of people? Who is the most unworthy of my grace? And he says, God saw me and chose to use me. Paul gives us this idea again, and, and this will be the last scripture I, I referenced this morning, but I want you to take note of, of how Paul views himself. He's not saying, I am righteous because of all these wonderful things, of all these persecutions I've partaken in. I'm righteous because I've suffered so much for Christ. No, he says, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12 through 15. Listen to what Paul says. He says, And thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And this is key here, verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. We might be tempted to be self-righteous and say, God saved me, yes, but he didn't save me for much. I wasn't that bad. We must understand that we can rightly probably say, just as Paul said, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief of who you are chief, of who we are chief. We are all sin-ridden apart from Christ. We are all worthy of his wrath, but it is by his grace that sinners like us are saved. So let us go into this world that which we live and not declare ourselves righteous and seek to lift ourselves up above others, but understand that it's only by the very grace of God that we have been saved. Not by our works, not by our natural state, but only by the work of Christ. Only by God's grace. What a blessing it is to know. Because I tell you, if we could have saved ourselves, God wouldn't have sent Jesus Christ. If there was any other way to save us, Christ wouldn't have been necessary. It wouldn't have been necessary for him to die on the cross. But because it was, he willingly laid down his life for sinners like me. For sinners like us. Praise be to God that he sees sinners like us who are unworthy. And by his grace, sends us salvation. Let us therefore go into the world like the publican saying... I'm unworthy, but God is good. I'm unworthy, but Christ has brought salvation.
Let us go living a life of praise, living a life not boasting in ourselves, but boasting in Christ, for he is worthy of all praise. With that, let us pray.